we'll go ahead and get started. And then, um, you know, if you have questions, if you're online, definitely put them in the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to those as we go throughout today. Um, but to start out with, so my name is Russell Fawcett. I am the Director of Operations with the Stern team and co-owner. Um, I'm also an active real estate investor. So I have uh, long-term holds and I also flip properties. So that's kind of been my strategy with investing. I started you know, with a couple of rental properties and then I did get into flipping properties as well. Um, today, we've got a couple of guests uh, that have joined me that are um, Kirk, and he is, we'll bring him up on the panel. So he runs or owns Grid Insurance. And then Lonnie Larson is our guest speaker today that is going to run through some of the basics. And she is with Advantage Property Management. Um, and so, and I apologize if I said that a little bit wrong. Um, but to start out with, I just wanted to, I guess, ask you guys, what were you hoping to get out of this? When you saw that it was, you know, an investment seminar or an investment class, what were you hoping? What what brought you out today? Education in general. What's that? Education. In education. General. Okay. Is there any any certain topic that you wanted to that you were hoping, or is it just kind of basic? Do you have rental in general. I have two properties. And okay. Like Airbnb. I, I think I asked somebody about. You had a good touch on that. Um, but yeah, it's rentals in general. I mean, the flipping strategy also, you know, learn more about it. Okay. So learn more about flipping. Yeah. The same, probably. I, uh, just how to jump in now. Okay. Um, you know, what tools are available to help further my help to move my investing forward. Okay. And do you have any properties or are you active in investing right now? Uh, a little, I've just done flips. Um, I'd really like to figure out the rentals thing a little bit okay. personally. Yeah. Welcome, welcome guys. So just starting out, we're just going over a little bit about what brought you out today. Why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of today? First, you're kind of like looking at the ether, but <laughs> uh, well, I had a fourplex. I got on the VA line had for about two years. And now at a point where I think I want to try and explore and expand and then kind of look at different ideas as just far as, far as my moral, my family, maybe experimenting with Airbnb, and also just trying to go out and make some real estate trends because that might be my experience with day jobs. It's just not the right form to get passionate about. <laughs> Extra stuff. Okay, sounds good. What about you guys? Um, yeah, we're just kind of brand new to this, looking at you know, eventually it'd be great to have some rentals, maybe, or yeah, just kind of want to get our feet in the water a little bit, learn more what's out there. Okay, sounds good. Well, hopefully, we'll be able to answer some of your questions, give you some things to think about, and then also, uh, kind of. So, the format today is we're going to have Lonnie just kind of go through kind of the basics, teach just you know looking at, at the value of investing in real estate, then we're going to bring up and we're going to panel. So I've got some questions for the panel. We'll kind of go through our stories, what we've done, how we got into investing in real estate. And at the end, I want to workshop a little bit. So you guys actually come out of here with something that you're going to go do. So you're going to take action as opposed to just coming and listening. So that could be, you know, talking with a professional in the industry about lending, about insurance, about property management, it could be like, okay, like what do we need to put in reserves in order to start our journey in investing? Or, you know, what is that person? What do I need to do next? We want to make sure everyone walks out of here with some type of action plan so that you don't just come in and sit, listen, and then, you know, forget about it in a week. Um, and so let's go ahead. We're going to start out. I'm going to bring up Lonnie Larson and we're going to give the floor to her and then we'll go from there. Hi, y'all. My name's Lonnie. I'm with Advantage Property Management. Um, I've been investing since uh, the dinosaurs. Um, I love it. 
I got to tell you, I've done flips. I've, I own a management company. I have my own properties. I think, honestly, it's the best way to grow your wealth. Um, so I'm going to go through this first. Think of questions on the way. Um, flips, blocks, and financial freedom. Why is my clicker not working? Okay, we might be on the wrong. This will take fun right out. <laughs> that should be working. Uh oh. Oh boy. Here we go. We love technology that we can't figure it out. Oh, it's working so well. Two seconds ago. Okay. Make that big and we're good. So we're going to talk about rentals and why that brings you financial freedom. First of all, we're talking about leverage. So um, if we look at a variety of different ways to invest, I personally think that you should do all of them. Can we make that bigger? Can we yeah. do a, a full screen? Here we go. Here we go. Um, so, but for example, if you start out with $100,000, who has $100,000 in their pocket? Let's address that right now. Anyone? 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 Okay. Um, if you put it into stocks, it's going to cost you the full $100,000. Um, you're going to have carrying costs of minimum, no other costs. Your income per year, maybe 8%. Who can get 8% out of their stocks? I used to could until this week. And now it's gone into the tank. So we did it again. Um, your adjusted ROI on if you get an 8% return is 4 to 7%. But your potential loss, if the company that you invest in takes a secretary to the Bahamas, you could potentially lose 100%, right? Do like this. Okay, so mutual funds. Also, potential loss of 100%. If you go into a money market, that's pretty safe, but your income is going to be only about 2%, right? So if you invest in property, <clears throat> you take that same 100000 but it's really only going to cost you about 20%, maybe even less. Um, your mortgage that you're paying is going to be offset by the rent that you receive. Maybe a 10% vacancy rate for vacancy and maintenance. Right now, our vacancy rate for my company is zero. So um, you do have an appreciation. We like to look at 5% because that is very um, conservative. You know, you'd rather plan on less and get more. Right now, in the state of Utah, the appreciation this year was, what, 27%? I mean, it's crazy. And you can't anticipate that? Yeah. Sorry, that 5% is not including inflation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the overall appreciation for the number that you bought the property for. So we're looking at an adjusted ROI of 25%, and your potential loss, because you only put 20000 in, is only 40%. I love rental properties. So if we look at just price appreciation, which was kind of your concern, um, if you look at market value when you buy the property, you put a little bit of equity in, that's your down payment. Um, hopefully you'll buy it good. Actually, the equity is when you bought it good. You know, you didn't pay top dollar. And then your investment is whatever the 20000 let's say, you put in. And then your debt is your mortgage. So in the beginning, your debt's pretty high, your equity's pretty low. But as the market value increases, Obviously, if you're having somebody else pay those payments, you get down to where it's all equity. And, and then with your in, investment in the small percentage of it. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's look at the numbers. If you buy a property for $350,000, can you get a property right now for $350,000? Yes, it's not easy. You have to shop, but you can buy one. Um, so we're going to have the sellers pay the cost. We're going to say that, that, keep in mind, this is super simple, just, you know, super simple, just to illustrate the situation. But if you put 20% down, 350K, you're looking at $70,000 down. Can we get less than that? Yes. Yes. 
Um, so your payment at 4% right now, what is a basic okay. interest rate for rental property? Four, one and a quarter. Yeah, sometimes three and a half. I actually just got one at three and a half. That's because I have great credit. Um, <clears throat> so your monthly rents on that are probably 2,400 easily more. <coughs> But depending on where it is, let's go with the conservative 2400 a month. So your cash flow, month one, $980. Thank you very much. But over a year, you're looking at a cash flow of $11,000, $11,760. Do the math, that's a 16.8% return on your investment. Better than the stock market even today. I think that's not anything to sneeze at, but let's look at over time. So over time, real property is going to appreciate. Of course, we talked about that five to this year, 27%. Statistically, it's five to 10% annually. Um, the last 20 years, even through the downturn, you know, through the horrible 80s. Was that 20 years ago? That was maybe was. <laughs> anyway, the appreciation rate for single homes averages out about 5% if we throw this year out, because I really think this year was an anomaly. So we're going to go through the money. Sorry, every time I click to let someone in, it's still different. <laughs> so this is like boring, but we're going to talk about it quickly. So we've got a purchase price of $350. we have got an appreciation. Uh, five percent first year, um, and then I only looked at a rent increase of three percent because once again, I'm being really conservative. Normally, we always do at least five percent, but this year rents have increased significantly more than that because the whole market's crazy. Um, anyway, if we extrapolate this all the way out, da, 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 and you hold the property for ten years. So on your tenth year. Your three hundred fifty thousand dollar property with conservative appreciation is going to be worth almost six hundred thousand dollars. Who believes that? Yeah. Um, your total appreciation then is going to be about two hundred fifty. Your cash flow, your pocket, is going to be one hundred eighty one thousand, which is not to be sneezed at. But if somebody else that OPM, other people's money, has paid your loan down about fifty six thousand. Because you know, at the front of the mortgage, it always has less uh, to pay a mortgage than it does at the end because you have to pay more interest at the front. Um, your return on an investment $460,000. And you still own the investment, so you can go on as long as you want. So, this is my favorite. Your return on investment over 10 years is almost 600%. Who wants a 600% return on investment? It'd be all right, huh? Better than a kick in the penny. Other things to think about is you also get tax deductions on all of this. It doesn't take into consideration vacancies, which, you know, we have had no problem with vacancies for years, and it doesn't take into consideration repairs and all of that kind of stuff. But there are ways that you can mitigate that. So. I'm going to take the 600% return on investment. So that's one property over 10 years. If you have more than one property, of course, you're going to see exponential returns. Plus, let's say you buy it at 3% interest, which brings that $70,000 down to, and you live in it for a couple of years or a year, and then sell it. Your return on investment skyrockets. Are you with me? Okay, so your family will hate you, but other than that, it's a great return on investment. So here's the tax write offs that you can assume that you're going to receive with a business, which is your rental property. It is a business. You're going to have operating expense write offs. So if you pay a property manager, all of that's tax deductible. Your um, interest rate is tax deductible. Your financing costs are tax deductible. Any miscellaneous closing costs that you pay. Depreciation is the only business I know where the value appreciates, but you can take depreciation in the taxes. Um, you do, you can write off capital improvements. If you buy a new 
you know, if we go fix the toilet, you're not going to be able to write that off. But if the capital improvements, like a new roof or something like that, is absolutely acceptable. Any personal property that you put into the home and any maintenance expenses, you can, depending on what it is. I always say consult your CPA. I am not a tax accountant, thank God. But um, they can give you some information. So my belief is that ownership of real estate is really a time game. First year, you know, you're looking at a different situation than you in over time because of the appreciation value. Um, so this is this is totally hokey, but I kind of love it. Um, it is your most able investment, which means it is accessible. Anybody can buy a property. It is appreciable, increases in value over time. It is rentable, cash flow, we love cash flow. Um, making money while you're sitting in um, It's improvable, you can put sweat equity in it, raise the value of the property through your sweat equity. Depreciable, deductible, deferrable. Um, it is stable. I love an investment that I can go touch because then I know what's happening with it. You know, if you invest in stocks, I hope it goes well for you, but you really have no control over that. But with an investment that you can touch, um, that I, I happen to be a control freak. <laughs> and so that makes me feel better. And most of all, it's livable. So it could either be at some point sheltered for you or for someone else. I think as a rental property owner, you're doing your service to the world. Because you're providing great, you know, livable buildings and homes for people. So where do you find rental property? <clears throat> Literally everywhere. Um, so pick what you like. My personal niche is not the most expensive homes. It's not brand new homes. I like homes that are single family. I like homes that have a garage and a yard. My thought is, Everybody, once they get kids, wants to put those kids in the backyard so they don't have to do it all day. I might be wrong. That's my personal belief. Um, so I like middle income. I think there are good people everywhere. You only hear horror stories about rentals. Very rarely do you hear somebody say, oh, I had the very best rental experience ever. Mostly people like to talk about the horror stories. But there's a lot of good stuff out there. I think there's good people everywhere. You just have to really have good, clean homes that attract clean, well-kept people, and you have a much better rental experience. Um, generally, lower-priced properties bring a higher ROI. And once again, I like local. Um, so let's talk about the types of residential investment. Condos, single-family, duplex, and fourplex units. Um, the pros for condos, less maintenance. Maybe they have amenities. Um, they can preserve your investment value. If you get a, a condominium association that takes good care of the property, it's going to preserve that value better for you. But there's only one unit to generate income. Um, so it's 100% loss for that month that it might have to be vacant. Um, you don't have really any control over condo fees. And um, the association, if you do get into a bad association where they are mismanaging funds or whatever, it can be a real expense. And actually selling a condo may take longer, may not. This year, a lot of condos have just kind of gone, you know, any property is selling. So um, single family home, once again, it's easier to resell. Typically it's surrounded by other owner occupants, which typically means people have a more um, private ownership in that home. So. Um, and you do see more appreciation, but still, it's only one minute to, to get income. And if it's taken, it's 100% loss, right? Are you with me? So duplexes, close to or in single family neighborhoods, so that might still have the value of private ownership. Um, it is less risk than a fourplex, more cash flow than a single family, lower appreciation, and it may be surrounded by other rentals. Um, fourplex. I only went up to fourplexes. Of course, you can buy an apartment if you want to an apartment building. 
Typically, fourplex units are the ones that you can get the best prices on for mortgages. So um, they do generate higher cash flow, minimize financial impact. If one place is unit, you, if one place is vacant, you still have the other units that are bringing in income. Um, there are economies of scale. So for example, if you're doing repairs, you're doing four refrigerators, you might get a better price to buy four than just one. And um, but there's more upkeep. You may kind of have to consider tenant damage because I think as a general rule, a fourplex um, doesn't have the same private ownership as people when they have just their single family home. And that's a general rule. I mean, I'm not saying across the board that's true, but you may have to get a complex which prepare. So how do you manage your rentals? <clears throat> A lot of people think managing rentals is throwing a person in the house and say it's any money. That's not all there is to it. Uh, property management is rent collection, mortgage or utility payments, accounting services, leasing, security deposits, what do you do with those, inspections, repairs and maintenance, all of that is encompassed in the whole property management situation. So if you're going to manage them yourself, um, Lots of laws you need to know. Who's surprised that there are many laws required everywhere? <laughs> um, so, fair housing laws, your tenant rights, landlord rights, fit premises law, contracts, background checks, there are specific laws that, that determine what is legal and not legal on all of these issues. Privacy, occupant limits, just for example, who knows how many occupants you can have in a bedroom in your home? Is that hard and fast? Why are there shared bedrooms? Ha, ah, I love it. See, I touched something already. Well, not yet, in two minutes. So um, in Utah, the occupancy limits on a one bedroom home are three. Generally, it is two people per bedroom, um, unless there's children involved or a pregnant lady or something like that. And um, the law also states that you can't have more than three unrelated individuals. I know, I like your <laughs> <laughs> No, true. There are some municipalities who allow it, sometimes up around universities or something, if, if that you know specific zoning allows it. But as a general rule, the maximum is three unrelated individuals. Um, you, the thing I see, to be honest with you, is when people finally find a good renter, they put it in, they never talk to them again. And as long as that rent's coming in, they never talk to them again. And if you figure you have a $300,000 investment and you have no idea what's going on with that, this is a bad situation. But a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to bug them. Bug them. Do it. We call people and tell them we're coming. First of all, I don't want to see the underwear on the floor and all that. I mean, I want it to look clean as what they think is clean, which is an indicator in itself. Um, but you want to check for safety issues. If there's a 35 outlets in, you know, one like the Christmas story, you've seen that where they have like I have three things plugged into one outlet. Um, so check for safety issues, check for leaks under sinks and any other water issues. Water issues are the number one thing that damages property. So make sure that that's what you check for. Make sure you have the right amount of occupants. Um, like I said, three unrelated or two per bedroom is the general rule. Um, if there is any property damage, if you see property damage early on, then you can number one repair it and be reimbursed for that property damage. If you wait until people move out, you may never see them again. Um, so know exactly who's in your property. Uh, please get a photo ID. People will say, I'm Joe Smith. And Joe Smith has great, you know, great background check, he has great uh, credit, everything looks fabulous. But the person that you're actually talking to is not Joe Smith. They stole his license or whatever. So meet them in person, get photo ID. Um, thorough background checks, I can go into that forever. Um, the Good Landlord Program, who's heard of the Good Landlord Program? Ah, so great. 
So the state of Utah and different municipalities have the good landlord program. It was put out there so that people learn all of these laws. They don't just assume I can get a rental property and everything will be fine. They actually do learn the laws. Um, it, it's actually a four-hour class. <clears throat> I teach it. So there's several other people. But um, it, what they do, if you go through the class and have that knowledge before you start into the whole rental thing, they give you a significant discount on your business license. So every municipality does not charge business licenses for rentals, but most of them along the West Coast front do. So if you buy a rental, I would say you definitely, number one, need to have that class. Well, your management company, if they have it, that also counts for you. So if you turn your property over to a management company and the management company has gone through the class, then you don't have to do it, you still get a discount. Um, but it is about 70 to 95% of a reduction in your business license. So that's you know. Question for you. Yes. Back on the background check. Yes. Is, are there certain things that if they come back, you're like, okay, are you actually okay with that? Is it, I mean, obviously you want the cleanest one, but are there certain things that you're looking for that say like, okay, this would completely uh, well, negate someone? So excellent question. Um, yes. And that's really up to you. So there isn't a law that says this is what it has to say, but Will you, for example, would you accept someone who had felonies? Maybe. Maybe I would if it was 10 years ago. Maybe if I, I would if the kid was 16 and he got into a fight and you know, whatever. I mean, so that's kind of each individual's thing. One thing that you can do, which is kind of interesting, is to say, okay, this is my criteria. You have to have three times the rent amount. You have to have no felonies. You have to have no back, no um, evictions. This is this is the what I'm looking for. But let's say I see somebody who has all of the good things that, except their credit is maybe poor because they have medical bills. Um, medical bills. Medical nobody knows when they're ever going to be paid. I mean, that's out there somewhere. So let's just say that's the issue. You think they're great people. You've done all your all your checks with their employment and their prior rental history, all of that. You like them, but they have this credit issue. You can do like a B criteria. So if they get my B criteria, I will say, okay, you know what? We're going to charge you a double deposit because that removes my anxiety that they will not pay the rent because of their bad credit. So there, there are exceptions to that, but really it's an individual thing. What comes up all the time is pets. Will you accept pets? 90, do you have a pet? No. You are a, an anomaly. You have a pet? Who has a pet? 90% of people have pets. So if you say no pets, which you absolutely are really allowed to do, you're gonna cut out 90% of your potential vendors. However, the caveat to that is it, it is uh, who's heard of a service animal? Who's heard of a companion animal? Do you know how, it is, how hard it is to get your dog or other pet registered as a service or companion animal? It's not hard. It's totally easy. So if you say no pets, if they have a companion animal or a service animal, you can't charge a pet deposit. You can't charge pet rent. None of that because it legally it's not a pet, it's a medical appliance. So keep that in mind. You may as well elect accept the pet and charge the deposit. That would be my there is a caveat, I'm sure. You know, well, yeah, and so, so we can discuss that later. Yeah. There is a caveat that short term. talk about short term rentals. I don't do short term rentals. So you have questions? So what's the number on that? Is it one per family, one per individual service animal site. That's a tough one. I have seen two, but I want to really track that and say, you know, who prescribed this, what that's like the outside edge. Most of it's one per person. Which if you have five kids, that can get up. They, but they if you're if you have a service animal, you can request to see the documentation from the governing body. 
because most people will say they have a service animal, but they don't have to. They're just saying that they don't even ask for the legal documentation, the prescription, the, the certification. They don't, they can't provide it, so they're defrauding. So that is there a difference just kind of in that kind of between like what I would consider real service animals versus some online certificate? Good point. I love that you brought that up because I was actually just going to say that there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Anybody can go online and okay. say, oh, I got a certification for my animal as a companion animal or whatever. That has no weight whatsoever. You can, it's, it's a little bit tricky what you can ask, what you can ask, but you can ask. Uh, I need the information directly from the provider. And I would never just accept it, <clears throat> though. Here's my documentation from my provider because I can make Photoshop sing and dance. So I always want to have me, you know, the owner go directly to the provider and say, I need this documentation. You can't say, what's their problem? What's the problem? But you can say, what does this animal do for them? And is this animal required? So for example, I had a tenant who wanted his service animal to be a Rottweiler. They are known to be hazardous breed. So I went back to the, the um, and I have to say provider because it's not always a physician. It's not always, I mean, the term, the, provider can be pretty broad, but I went back to them and said, does it have to be this raw? And they said, well, yes, it does. So, I mean, those are the questions you can ask. You can't ask, you know, why, what's wrong with them? Why do they need it? But you can't say, what do they do for them? And does it have to be, you know, a, 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 a service? You can ask those questions. Okay, so the bottom line, um, in order to make good, come on, it was a good chuckle. It's worth a chuckle. <laughs> um, in order to make money, reduce the amount of work, screening is the foundation. You have to screen, make sure you get good people. You know, I like to look at their car because how people keep their car very often is kind of how they keep their house. So if, if the steering wheel is so sticky, you know, you'd be like grossed out or there's 500 piles of whatever you want to say. Um, that's an indicator of how they'll keep the property. So, um, do you check motor vehicle reports? No, I don't care how to drive. You know why? I drive like a bat, bat out of hell, and I am a great tenant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you hire a professional manager, not everyone can effectively manage rentals. If you are not comfortable going up to somebody and say, hey, you know what? I think you're awesome, but your rent's late, so you gotta pay me today or I'm gonna throw you out. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you see what I'm saying. You have to be have enough gumption to say, this is the contract. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my end of the contract. I expect you to do the same. Um my husband could never be a rental manager. He's like, nah, I don't care. Nah, I don't care, whatever. So um, get recommendations. If you're going to hire somebody, I would say talk to their previous clients and find out if they're good. I have to tell you, there's a lot of bad management companies out there. So make sure that you get recommendations. Verify their inspection policies, their repair policies. Who reimburses what for repairs? Who does repairs? Do they have to keep their in-house uh, service guy busy all the time? So he's charging for a bunch of repairs. That, or you know, do they pay the highest vendor out there because they don't care it's not their money? I mean, there's issues that you want to talk about. How many employees per units? Are they good landlord certified? Um, response and payment and, and payment times. If you call 45 times and nobody ever calls you back, that's not a good thing. And honestly, I've seen that. Yeah. So are these all things that you put into your contract? Like initially when you're giving it to the client? Like, That's <coughs> an excellent question. Um, I say yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I don't know if, if it's not written in the contract, it's certainly something that you want to discuss. Mm -hmm. And I'm easy. It's like if somebody wants to work with me, I don't want to work with them. So, yeah. Um, but 
that excellent question. It's certainly something that it, it and especially the hot button to you, I would say, you know, I want to be specifically addressed. Yeah. Um, payment times, you want to make sure that they don't collect your rent and not pay you for a month. I mean, it should be certainly, I guarantee it's going to be out to you by the 15th of the month or something like that. It can't be on the first, honestly, because late payments come in, the mail, you know, all of those things. But it, you want to have a reasonable payment time. That's it. That's it. That's all I got. Dave, who's got questions? I have a question. So this is my first time renting a property, so I didn't revise the rental agreement thoroughly. Yes. It's just the basic. Yes. Right. Like you said, we found our money, right? Is there like a clause or disclosure that states something in the case of any tenant committing misdemeanor or felony or something like that where you can just take actions and say yes. yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So if you get a good, if you get a good contract, that definitely is something that's in there, especially when it is concerning neighbors. You know, they it, like if you have, especially if you have like a duplex or something like that. But I mean, the short answer to your question is absolutely there should be because yeah. And so let me just give you one more little tip about contracts. People who want to move into a property will sign anything. Oh yeah. And then a month later, you say, no, 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 this is what your contract says. I say, well, I don't know that. It didn't say that. I say, okay, well, let me send you a copy. And let me show you right here where your initials are on that paragraph. Where you say, yes, I read this. And it shuts it down a little bit. So. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, thank you. We're going to definitely dive into some more questions as well. Um, yeah. Um, one of my tenants, he, uh, I've never accepted the pay online, but he keeps on drawing up like Western Union touch. He's trying to encourage me to pay online, so I have to just accept this thing that he drops off. Yeah. So I have a specific philosophy about that, and it's called send me money. I don't care how you send it. I just want money. Right. So <laughs> if they give me cash, if they give me a check, right. I only have a bounce check once. Right. If they bounce a check, that's it. You can't. Because the cashier's check or cash. Right. Because uh, I guess the idea is eventually, if I'm not, since I live there, it's fine. I'm just going to go somewhere else. Yeah. No, and there are companies that will only check online. Um, most of my stuff comes in online because we make a uniform. Um, but bottom line, if they're like, maybe they're LED or people like, you know, online, um, I don't care. Just bring it on time. Early is good. So again, Kirk Chester um, has Airbnb or short-term rentals, um, and you know we heard Lonnie and then myself as, as well. So I have some long-term rentals, and then I flip properties as well. So kind of want to dive into that, and, and I think most of you got it. So just a very basic flow, right, of buying a property. So you know you're going to find it, you're going to analyze it, buy it, manage it. And then grow. So you could say grow is, you know, as far as keeping them, you could also um, label that as your exit strategy, right? How are you going to get paid at the end of the day? Should you be looking to cash out on the equity of the property? Um, the other thing, though, that, that's not on here as far as, and maybe you could lump it into analyze, what do you do before you get started? If, if you haven't got started yet, um, you know, what are the steps you need to take? 
And so kind of, you know, one of the first questions I would ask is, as you guys looked at getting into investing in real estate, what did you, I mean, what did you have to feel like you needed in reserves prior to buying that first property? Me first? Yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. I think it depends on our financial stability at home. So your, your tolerance of risk. So as a single 21-year-old, my tolerance of risk was out the window because if it failed, I didn't hurt it. Now I'm married with two kids and a wife and all of the above. My tolerance for risk is probably declining. And so what do I need to put in reserves to start the process? Um, the down payment is going to be number one. In a long-term rental, I'd probably look at six months rent. I want to have some cash reserves sitting aside, whether it repairs. Uh, I've seen a property damage to the point where it takes two or three months to, re to rehab that back to the result. And so you have to have those repair costs. So Roughly 10% of your gross rents for the year is probably a good starting point. But six months of reserves of your mortgage payments is a pretty conservative. Uh, as you acquire more properties, and Lonnie can attest to this, it doesn't have to be six months for every property because you can spread that risk over multiple units. Uh, what Rusk isn't saying is that I own an insurance brokerage that insures uh, five to 10,000 properties over the years. So I've seen every kind of real estate transaction from the risk management standpoint. So I get to watch and be sitting inside a lot of the transactions that most people have never seen. So I've seen a few of those things go on. Um, we have a current client who bought a property to flip. They had an engineer's inspection after the acquisition. They had to tear, down, tear down the property and rebuild it. <laughs> so due diligence is one of those things that I would be very, very prepared with. Checklists are very high concern so yes what he said also honestly inspections I, I cannot stress that enough most of the time what they tell you is you know like that furnace only has five years worth of life that does not mean you don't buy the house that means you know that you're going to have that expense come up so you plan for it or the roof is only got whatever it is so Aside from catastrophic stuff, there's also this gives you an idea how to plan for what's going on. So when I bought my flip properties, I would, I think I know everything. I told you I'm a control group, right? So I would go in and um, look at, okay, that furnace looks ugly, but I know how much a furnace costs. I've got a good enough price on this property. I'm going to take that into consideration. So it's just kind of one of those things, but I would always, always say that a professional inspection is worth its weight in gold. And dear God, please pay for it and then read thoroughly. <laughs> True that. Because True that. I, again, I'm in insurance and I write Paris Emissions Insurance for home inspectors. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, the only claims that arise on home inspection property inspectors is the client that didn't read the inspection. So uh, one of our clients, uh, and I put it, he does this as well, they have an IP log, so it, it tells them when and where they open the inspection. And so when it goes to legal, if they've never opened the inspection, all legal liability will be washed. And from a buyer's perspective, why are you paying for a tool you're not going to use? Well, and, to, and to, to jump on that, they will give you a, here's a list of the hot items. Don't just read the hot items. Read all 32 stupid pages of that report. And if you have a question on a very specific place, let's say it's an electrical issue, hire an electrical contractor to go in and do a thorough diagnosis of the electrical system. Because an inspector will point out an issue, they may not see what's underneath that issue. If there are, or I had a claim, it was a million dollar litigation that lasted five years, there were cracks in the stucco around the windows. And it was recommended by the inspector to hire a window professional to make sure that there wasn't something wrong with the windows. Turns out the windows were installed sideways, so the beep holes that allow water to get through the window were on the bottom, so the rain would come through and come into the house. $170,000 of windows. This is bad. <laughs> so I've seen the worst of the worst, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, if you're, if you're paying for an inspection, read it, and like Wanda said, read all 32 pages or 55 pages, it hurts to read it, especially for people like me who are 100 miles an hour, but those are things you take the time to do. 
So the original question was, how do you get into it? Um, tolerance for risk is a big part of it. What I would say is I see people all the time who say, okay, I'm going to do like four at once, and then I can do all of these at the same time, buy all of this stuff at the same time. I have seen this is how I'm a conservative investor, so but uh, this is how people lose their shirt. So I would say, especially at the beginning, get a good property. If you're going to do repairs on it, say, oh, well, I can do those repairs myself. I'm going to get a hard money loan, and it's going to be great, and I'm going to have it ready to go in 30 days, making money to pay back my loan. How many times have we seen that go belly up? I mean, I would say be conservative. If you get a hard money loan, don't get one where it has to be paid off within 30 days, even 60 days. Whatever you're doing to do repairs on your own, it's going to take you longer than you think it will. Every time. It's going to cost more than you think it will. Regardless, Every now, time. you have the accessibility of contractors is almost impossible. So you might think it takes a week, like three, just because they may not have time to get there. Four or five. Um, so, and so the second issue is if you're going to buy it and live in it and get that lower down payment, I think that works well as long as you don't be house poor. So by house poor, I mean you buy a property that takes every bit of your income and you barely squeak into you know, I can, I can buy this if I work overtime kind of thing. Don't be house poor. Get in. Make sure that you have enough that you can then build your equity. And then if, if that's your plan, which I don't think it's a bad one. I mean, it's, for old people, it would be terrible. But if you're starting out, then you can build up your portfolio slowly over time, which is a good way to do it. And conservative, and then you don't get into trouble. Yep. And so for me, I mean, I look at it for us, it's a minimum of three months returns. I mean, that is the bare, bare minimum. Um, but when I was getting into it, like actually saving up to have that down payment and have the reserves, right? It was, I didn't think it was going to happen. Like, I mean, it just kept going and going. So we actually, I was one that, you know, my first rental property was the townhome that we, you know, one of our first purchases you know, and we lived there to a point where we did end up with equity and my reserve for that property. So we, we went out and we bought the home that we're in now, but my, my original reserves came from a line of credit. And so I did go get a line of credit for my property while I still live there. I got a $25,000 line of credit that was only going to be used in case of that emergency. And so with that though, until you know, the property did cash flow at the time we moved out. I mean, cash flow is amazing now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it, at the time, even at that time, though, we were cash flowing is about $600 when we moved out. And the, the mortgage on it, my mortgage payment's just over $1,000. So we didn't touch the rent that came in. That was, okay, it's going to go towards building up that reserves so that we actually didn't have to rely on the line of credit um, in order to use that. And then the other thing as far as starting out, so I got that in place. Um, and then as far as when I started in flipping, so it was almost that exact same thing. That line of credit became my reserve when I got into flipping as well. And one of the things that I'll say, you know, when you get into flipping, unless you have a construction background, that first property needs to be more of a paint and carpet job. You're not going to, hit the home run, right? You're probably not going to make the, the 60, $70,000, but you learn a lot. So our first property that we did, it was a little um, single family home down in Provo. We knew, you know, again, we had, we ran the numbers as far as the market analysis. We knew what we could sell it for after the fact. And we were very, very conservative. And we did the work on that first one, other than actually installing the carpet. I mean, I was there, you know, tearing out the carpet. I was tearing out the tile. I, I did a lot of the work myself. So, and, and even the stuff that we hired, I was there watching them do it. Like I wanted to know what are these guys doing and a paint and carpet one that on paper, I would have walked in and said, okay, we can knock this out in two weeks. Took us over two months to get through the rehab of that first property because we were doing it on weekends and you know different things. So even just 
you know, again, that paint carpet job, we, we redid the counters as well. Um, it took us a while, but we did make money on it. And we learned a lot through that process of like, holy cow, when I do my numbers, I need to account for insurance. I need to account for utilities. Like, I can't just go in and say, the carpet's going to cost me this. The paint's going to cost me this. Here's my numbers. We learn, and, and, you know, even being in real estate, I should have known that going in, but we learned that I've got a, I've got holding costs that aren't just the interest on the loan that I have. We actually, again, the utilities, the insurance, the, um, you know, the, not on this one, but because it wasn't big enough, but, you know, on other ones, the permitting fees, like all of a sudden it's like, okay, if you're going to do something that's actually going to uh, take a permit, add another month or two to your holding costs because you have to wait on the city to actually come out and, you know, walk the property. Um, you know, they may tell you certain things. Uh, we had one in Ogden that we did where we ended up, you know, getting the permit and we didn't think we needed to, to do anything with the exterior walls because we hadn't really touched them, but they came in and they're like, your exterior walls don't have insulation. So now we're ripping out everything to insulate the whole house that we haven't planned on, right? And so with those things, you need to make sure that, that you have the room. And, and so I guess, again, if you're gonna get into flipping, start small. Like, and, and you know. But I would say start small square footage wise too. So don't go in and try to flip a three or 4,000 square foot house, flip a condo, or six, seven hundred, eight hundred square feet. You can manage a lot more construction in a smaller space and still, even if it if it breaks even, you're still getting in and out of that property quicker. Um, back to your original question about what does it take to kind of get started? Uh, I did a zero down owner occupied owner flip, right? So I lived in the property and sold it in November of 2007. The luckiest sale of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that got lucky. Uh, we netted 60 to 70 thousand dollars from that sale, and that money went into an investment in Rose Park right after the market crashed. We held that property as a long term investment. Um, and when you talk about the tenant with bad credit, the tenant that lived in that property for six years, one yard of a year for Rose Park, five years to in my property. He had a medical bankruptcy. Uh, he was a Coke, Coca Cola distributor guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he <was> for Swire. <laughs> uh, but everything penciled out perfectly except his credit. And it's because he got trashed in the medical world. And so uh, that was my avenue or path into that. And then I 1031 two properties into a short term rental. And so the path can be different, but it's a it was nine to ten years. So people look at my short term rental as doing really well. I don't know how do I get into that? It's like overnight success. It's not. It's a long term play. Now, obviously, if you have the cash to set aside to move forward, that's a different conversation. But find something small. Start small. Don't try to jump into the big properties. Um, I again will be moving from my current residence. We'll sell the property because it doesn't make sense to be a rental property. How many bedrooms? Too many. Six, five, yeah, too many. five or six. Too many. I don't it's think. almost a 5,200 square foot property. So if a tenant damages something in that property, the cost to repair it is dramatic, right? It's higher in finishes. Uh, and so I would rather take the equity of that and buy three or four smaller properties, spread my risk, and then move forward. But in that same sense, that's what I would say start small. And you can do the owner on. I actually started with HELOC too. When I I have a cabin, my husband was not happy. He said, "You're gonna, you know, get a HELOC on this." He's happier now. Because, <laughs> um, but that's that's the way we started. Is we took our equity uh, and used that to actually buy three different properties. So, I, I not all at once. I tried to do three at once because I thought I was great at it. You know, I had a lot of success. I'm good at this. I can do this stuff. I bought three at once because that's what they tell you is the best way. It's not. It drove me absolutely wacko. And I had a lot of experience doing it. So. Okay. So before we get into finding how we find properties, anything, any other questions that you guys had as far as 
maybe what what you need to do prior to I mean kind of what you need to do to get started. Okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned five and twelve seven. You sold property and then you got another one. What is the time frame to use that ten thirty one and change that? Day -day. We have to identify in forty five days and then you have to close in half an hour. So identify the property forty five days and then close the real estate transaction with underneath. And then eighty after the forty five. Okay. okay. And then it's all one also probably. No, no, not after the forty fifth day. From the beginning, so you go in and register. I want to buy. I want to use this as a ten thirty one. You get forty five days to say this is the property I want to do it on. You actually can choose three. This is the property I want to do it on, and then they give you. The 180 days from the beginning to closing on one of those properties. Oh, okay. Does everyone understand what a 1031 exchange is? So that's where you're going to essentially sell a property and buy another property and defer any tax, tax consequences from the sale of that property. So when you sell a property, if, if, if you have to pay capital gains tax, I defer that capital gains tax into the next property. There are some legal ramifications. You have to buy a property of higher value. There, so you can't take a 1031 and pay cash with the equity for the property. You uh, still stated a capital uh, was like equal or higher value. Equal or higher oh. or multiples. So sometimes they'll split that property into multiples. Okay. So yeah. you need to discuss it with the CPA. I've done it once. Yeah, discuss it with the CPA. Make sure your title company knows you're doing a 1031. They're going to have to work with the intermediary. Um, you know, so there's uh, I. I ran into someone that was like, you know, sold the property. I was like, okay, how do I do this um, so that I can defer these taxes? It's like, it's too late. Like, you needed to address that, you know, when you were buying it, how you closed, because there's rules on how the funds are held, how, the, how you identify the property, how you close. So, again, when you get into the 1031, that needs to happen as far as the discussions. Like before you buy the property, I mean, you would say sure you have that. You're going to be selling a piece of property, you know, you're investing in another one. Start that process now. Like if you, if you decide I'm going to liquidate this to buy more, you need to find and identify, like I said, a title company, a real estate agent, and a mortgage lender that understands how a 1031 process works. Oftentimes, a title company will have a legal department that will handle that for you. And so they will, they will help you through that process. But that's down the road. In the Estate investment process. So, if you do decide you're going to sell and reinvest, which is a certainly a great thing to do, I've seen them all do it. They'll take their equity and double the properties. It's a great option. So, and then as far as I guess before you know going out and shopping, what type of did you guys set up any businesses? And I guess my disclaimer is we're not attorneys, we're not CPAs. This is our experience with it, right? But did you guys set up any type of legal entity? Um, First property was a sole proprietor that I turned into an LLC. Um, for me, legally, why I did an LLC is I can write a ton of stuff off. I can wipe out almost all of my income between depreciation and capital acquisitions where I have break -over. So that's why I did it that way. But it's not free. You have to document it correctly in property taxes. So there's a hassle factor, but all of my stuff now sits in LLCs. So I have. Four LLCs. I don't like the too many properties in one. So they do, uh, they can roll over. So if you have a problem with one property, they can take, you know, information and information the property. So I have four, four maybe five. I have four. No, I have none. Well, anyway. You have four. Anyway. For your investment properties. Yeah. Anyway, I had another one. If I had some that were in my name, which is stupid. So, do not put properties in your name. An LLC is not that expensive um, and, and it protects so much. For, there's a, just so many benefits. So, I would always say at least an LLC. They do have a form of an LLC that's called a uh, series, which you can put it in kind of separate, but there's lots of rules that are surrounded that. If you're interested, I would say talk to your CPA, talk to somebody who is experienced in running properties. Because a lot of your CPAs know the basics for taxes and income and all of that, but they don't have a lot of information about what to do with the number of rental properties. Yep, and I'm the same way. I mean, mine are in LLCs. Um, you know, one of the things is it, 
I have some like you that I have an LLC that has multiple properties in it. I have, you know, an LLC that just has one single part of that is dependent upon do you have partners, right? Or are you, you holding them individually? And so, you know, the, the big thing, is, as Lonnie said, is I definitely wouldn't recommend you hold a rental property in your personal name. I would set it up both for legal purposes and for tax purposes as well, because again, the tax advantages with owning rentals, um, you know, just kind of as an example, I mean, we closed on a property on December 30th, just because we needed another property to be able to depreciate to offset some more taxes. And so it was like, okay, like the, the amount that my down payment was, I was actually going to save in tax payments. Um, and so it, it was something that, I mean, again, there are some huge tax advantages in addition to, you know, any cash flow you might get from holding uh, rental properties. Can I just jump in one really quick thing on when we're talking about how to get money to buy properties? Um, if anybody has like a, a, a real job where they have <laughs> an IRA, you do have the capability to self-direct that IRA. I don't want to get anywhere near it in this context because there's lots of legal rules and stuff. But just know that that is an option if, if like maybe a spouse or, or someone like that, that is an option where you can take whatever you have in those IRAs and self-direct it into buying properties. Yep. And yeah, I definitely want to touch on a couple different strategies. Again, today is not about the financing side. We, we, we can follow up on that, but I do want to touch on a couple of those items later because again if you're waiting until you have that 20 or 25 percent down there's loan programs or there's other ways again depending on how adverse you are to risk there are some ways that you can get in a little bit quicker as well um, as opposed to saving and, and waiting until you have that 25 percent down um, let's go ahead and jump into kind of the first thing though it, it's finding a property let's Check my, I think we just have the one. So I'll jump in on, I guess I'll find the property. Um, my criteria is much different than I would probably say these guys are. Uh, I own vacation rentals. Uh, that's my target market. That's my target data. Uh, my vacation rental is 110 miles from my house. I look for properties with amenities. So I want to find something that's going to create a unique experience where I can charge a higher daily rate, if you will. So the property I own happens to be like front of the dock in Utah. So I have a private dock on the water. It's probably one of, I mean, Bear, excluding Bear Lake, it's probably one of 50 properties in, in Utah. Most reservoirs don't allow. No crack, just that. <laughs> <laughs> I got lucky because it was in our family for 50 years and decided to liquidate it, so we purchased it. And it was a big risk because it's in a very, very rural community. Um, but when I look for property, it's going to be something like that. I will look at the Cottonwood Canyons area. Why? Because there's ski resorts available in the winter time, and there's mountain biking and other activities in the summertime. Corner Canyon and Graper area is a great option if there is a big biking community that's interested. Uh, another amenity that most people don't consider when we're looking for the short term rental market is nursing, skilled nursing, and contract labor. So within a radius of a hospital or a medical center where they have contract labor, it is, it is something that I look for. Uh, the other piece that I look for is legal issues. In Cottonwood Heights, for example, if the home is zoned as a single family residence, it's illegal to own a short term rental on that property. It's enforced by complaint only, and it's the same as Salt Lake City. But the neighbors always complain. But there are hundreds of short term rentals in those markets. So if you, it's your risk tolerance, what are you willing to look for? And so when I look for a property, I'm looking for an amenity or an activity that someone is going to go for a destination. Uh, I use a software to analyze that process so that I can understand what my cash flow potential could be. Which is that? Uh, it's called Airbnb, so it's the back end of Airbnb. Mm -hmm. So you can purchase local municipalities, you can buy a national subscription, both are not cheap. But in the same regard, if you don't have that information, you're stabbing the target. So an example of the target area that I look at right now is the health plan. Um, 
it's called back junction. So it's 30 to 40 minutes to Jackson for the skiing and all the recreation for the higher end stuff. It's also one of the benchmarks for white water rafting in the summer, ATP in the winter. There is a snowmobile school in Alpine, Wyoming, <coughs> where I would partner with the school to give them a kickback to book our property. And so I look very specifically for amenities that I can market the property to. It is not anywhere near what they're looking at if we don't look at the same type of business. So, and, and I'm sure you've done a little bit of analysis as far as along the Wasatch Front. Absolutely. If you were to go local, I mean, what are some of those areas that you see maybe have performed a little bit better than than others? Or I guess, what would I be looking for if I wanted to stay in, say, Salt Lake, uh, Davis, or Utah County? I mean, it's purchase price. So if we're looking at cost, Park City is always going to cash flow. Some of the properties that are skiing and ski out are generating two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year rent. No, no kidding. Million dollar homes, two hundred fifty grand a year rent. Now your threshold to get into that twenty two and a half percent down. It's a lot. Right? It's not an entry level property. Um, I would say, uh, what's the new ski resort down south by Beaver? Eagle Point or Eagle Point? Yeah. So Eagle Point has property for sale around 100 to 250 thousand dollars. They're selling lots ski and ski out for 100 grand. They have to build a house, so again threshold. But Eagle Point is an entry level ski resort. Uh, Cherry Hill is similar. Um, Snow Basin, all of the establishments are not. It's an area that I would probably look at is some of the condos in those areas. If you can pick up a smaller ski and ski out condo like Bryant Head, they're 200 to 250 thousand dollars. And they have a property management company that is designed specifically to handle the resort traffic. And then as far as again around here, when do they perform better? I mean, is are we, you know, I know ski season if you're you know kind of sandy or somewhere on the, that east bench, I know typically ski season they're they're booked out if we're having a good ski season. Do they ramp well in the summer or yeah. they're kind of all in spring? So interestingly, a couple areas that went really well. Um, the technology slopes. So there are a lot of contract labor that buys in and works on projects down in the high area. Uh, obviously the ski resort area is going to perform really well in the winter. Bear Lake, any lakeside resorts are going to perform very, very well in the summer. If you're investing in short-term rentals, I would look at staggering your seasonality. So my property on the water does really well in the winter or in the summer does very slow in the winter. So I'm going to look for a winter property to offset my I have people ask me all the time. Uh, I have this rental. I'd make a lot more money if I did a short term. And I said, well, there are issues with that. And you know, he was just saying, if it's in this area, in this area, in this area, it's going to be awesome. If you're in West Valley, you're probably not going to have a great you know, return on investment at, sh at short term rental. Right. So those are the things you really need to consider: is why why would people want to rent this on a short term? Which is pretty, you know. Not not all of that difficult. I wouldn't want to rent this house as a short term rental. There's no amenities for me. There are positives and negatives on short terms. Um, money is positive. Also, if you can get somebody who manages all of that, it's more expensive than a regular property management. What is it? 30%, 25 to 30% of your amenity fees. So keep that in mind. Is that on top of all the extra main fees or just? Your management fees will be between 20 and 30 percent. That's why I don't do short term rentals. You have to understand the hassle factor of short term rental right. returning a property weekly, daily. Right. I have an inquiry setting with my watch. So it's so different. Kind of, what kind of revenue? I guess if we just make a simply, if we're not on a thousand dollar property, what kind of revenue would you expect to get annually for that? Where? To, what's that? But that's, that's that's the hardest question to answer because where is it? And, and, and that comes into just kind of you're going to have to run like a performer or you're just projected, right? What's my projected revenue? And, and it's, I think it's funny. There's a lot of people that will get into formulas and different things with rentals. Uh, I actually don't like even whether it's a flip, whether it's a residential, like it, you know, I want to know what is my cash flow and or how much money am I going to make when I sell it? And so that's how I analyze it, right? So you start with purchase price, you, then you figure out if you're holding it, you know, what is it going to cost me every single month? What can I rent it for every single month? So whether it's short-term or long-term, 
what are my expenses associated with it? So the short term, you're going to have cleaning, you're going to have a higher management fee, things like that. At the end of the day, what is my cash flow and does that meet my investing criteria? <clears throat> so you mentioned something about the tax slopes, right? A really high area. I live in Eagle Mountain, about eight minutes from that Facebook project. So I have two ideas. I don't know why you think the best is my base and I wanted to finish it. You're gonna do like a long-term lease, or I was going to finish it really nice with the amenities and stuff. You're gonna do it for Airbnb purposes for like more of a business niche. Um, you need to run the numbers. So in, in the South Lake market, there are no short-term rentals that can tell you roughly what you can generate from that. And the second thing I would say is you need to be prepared for the hassle and the property damage. Bingo. That was another one I was going to bring up. So he's a wise man. So I anticipate 10% of my gross rents every year in repairs. Um, we have holes in couches from fires because we have a wood stove and it's a late front cabin with a wood stove. And I'm not changing. Um, we have property damage to where they have pets in the house. We've had stains on the carpets. We've had parties. We've had suitcases roll down those stairs and go through the wall, and then they tried to patch it. <laughs> Slap them out of there and cracked because they didn't know how to patch sheetrock. Uh, we have had late night calls where there is a mouse in the wall, and I have to drive down there at midnight. So there are different hassles that come with that. Now, the cash flow is dramatically better. I will tell you that. But when you ask me the question about what is a hundred thousand dollar property do, I can't tell you. Right. Because the well, first year of my property, and I'll just give you the hard numbers, the first year is twenty five thousand bread. This year, this last year, it did eighty seven. So I'm building a clientele. We're building reviews on the short term sites. We're building a direct booking process. So as long if you have a marketing strategy and you have a I would say a theme. If you will. So, we want to have the mountain cabin that the, we call the Rocky Mountain Escapes, right? So, someplace to get away from the city, spend some time away from those things. The other piece that we look at is is there access to high speed internet? With COVID and all of the other things that have happened, how many people can now work remotely? They are willing to pay top dollar to be able to crash in a place for two weeks as long as they have access to high speed internet to do all of their meetings, all of the things they need to do, and then they can take a walk and really enjoy it. You have to, I can't tell you specifically what a hundred thousand dollar investment would be. Right. I guess what I was getting what I was trying to hear is as far as at what point does it incentivize you to what kind of numbers does it incentivize you to make it uh, or make it worthwhile for a short term I have to have high cash flow. Right. High high cash flow. So and you know it's gonna rent. And so I never do short-term rentals because number one, I don't want the hassle factor. Number two, there is there is a certain level of I know, like if I rent a property to a, a, a regular you know family, the likelihood that they're gonna be there for a long time, pretty high, pretty high. So I know who's in my property, I know what I'm gonna get, you know, every year I'm gonna see an increase in those rents. So um, a lot of people don't understand. I mean, I love that, that you're here because that's a totally different market. So, but a lot of people come to me and say, okay, what would be better? Would it be better for me long-term or would it be better for me to do the short-term rental deal? Most of the time, depending on absolutely location, it's going to be better to do long-term because of all of those factors. There's a lot of damage that you don't even consider. For example, in Park City, those short-term rentals that they do, they have a lot of mold. Weirdly, people come in off of the slopes. You know, They take up all of their wet stuff, all of that moisture gets in. Then they go home. They lock that sucker up, and it just, you know, you wouldn't, that might be something that you wouldn't anticipate, but it's a huge expense. So my portfolio is all long-term home, um, long-term rentals. I love single family with a garage. I have a couple of multi-family, but um, not big ones. I like that type of clientele. I'm, I'm a lot more personal. I'm a lot more, you know, um, and the people who, I have one gal who's rented one of my properties for 22 years. 
keeps it in great shape. She's happy there. Marek comes in every every month. No worries. You know, we paint it every once in a while for. It. Um, but it is a completely different market. So you have to know your level of acceptance, your level of stress. And honestly, I think the biggest thing is location. Okay, so, so let's talk about location. What do you what do you specifically look for Me? in kind of your locations? So I have been in Salt Lake Valley for a number of years, and everybody has told me, well, don't buy on the west side. You don't want to buy on the west side. So I have had properties, that, you know, east side, 20 to the east, whatever, nice brick homes. They're older because that's what you find in Cottonwood Heights and in those areas. They do not cash flow. What you pay for them, you don't get the same in rent. So my personal is if I find a rental home in a nice neighborhood, doesn't have to be in a high dollar neighborhood. I have homes in Kearns. I have homes in West Jordan. I have homes in Magna. I personally love Magna. People think that's weird, but I make a ton of money on my Magna homes. Um, I, they're nice homes. We keep them in good condition. They're in the nice neighborhoods in those areas. And our cash flow is awesome. So really, my might be different. Like I have friends who will only buy new townhomes because they don't have to worry about the yard. They don't have to worry about you know all of that. They only buy new townhomes. Their cash flow is less, but they have less to worry about. So it kind of is what your personal thing is. That's my personal niche. So for me, I, I'm kind of the same way. The the higher end homes. I mean. And, and you can look on like Rentler KSL, right? You can go see what things are renting for. The difference in rent between something out in Magna or you know on the east side isn't enough for me to go spend another three hundred thousand dollars to buy the home. So as far as me, like I have rentals all over. Like so, we have quite a few in Tooele. Uh, we you know that's an up and coming market, and those cash flow amazingly. And they're a little bit, you know, they're less expensive than buying something on the Wasatch Front. Um, I have a property in Tremont that was kind of a unique situation on that one. But one of the things is I dove into that, um, it, it cash flowed. I mean, it, it made a lot of sense. So that was actually one that, you know, there was a family that moving out, they have 11 kids, their landlord sold from underneath them. They didn't have anywhere to rent. There literally was nothing for rent and Tremont. He needed to stay there to keep his job. So I went and purchased a home and rented it back to him. Um, people say that, but when I look at, I mean, I did it like, like it was, you know, it, it was something that I was doing to help this family. Yes, that is, that was the original thing of why am I even looking into this? The reason I did it, like, honestly, though, part of it was like, this makes business sense. I was able to buy that, you know, we, we did a Mountain America 10% down loan um, and I cash flow on it. And so, and the other thing that I realized about that, at least right now, we'll see what the future holds, but I don't, you know, they're building the tree mountain, you know, there's stuff coming in there that is going to make that area boom. Eventually that, pro that property that I paid a lot less than it, it would have been down here is going to be worth, I mean, so I am playing a little bit of the long game, but realizing that there's nothing for rent, if for some reason they did move out of the home, I know that I can rent that property and I can rent it overnight at a premium. I mean, it, it just because nothing else is available, right? And, and so a lot of maybe, you know, Salt Lake City landlords aren't looking to go on the outskirts, but I look at it, it and I really see this, so my townhomes in Cedar Hills, when I bought it, Cedar Hills was still like, so that's by Alpine Highland, right? It, but it was like, that's a long ways to drive from I-15. Like we don't want to go all the way out. Well, like Alpine and Highland became so expensive. Now all of a sudden kind of that, that population just naturally migrated into Cedar Hills. And, and that property is more than doubled in less than, I mean, I've had it for eight years and it's more than doubled in value. So I think that's an excellent point that people always say, what do you require for cash flow? Honestly, I have bought properties for negative cash flow. Well, a lot. But the reason that I felt like it was a good purchase is because I know that that is, you know, if I have to put $50 a month for a year, 
I'm kind of okay with that. I got a good price on it. It's a good property. It's going to, it, it cost me 50 bucks a month for a year. And now I make. Well, and I think that goes back down to your buying criteria, right? Yep. Like what are you looking for? Because if I buy a short term rental, I want a 40% return on cash because the hassle factor one. And two, uh, did you guys know that the Southeast Health Department shut down short term rentals for three months? The Southeast Health Department, Moab, Price, that area, shut down short term rentals and hotels during the pandemic for three months. Yeah. So if you think about like, what are the hazards, they're different. And so when I look at a property, I can't make good cash flow, it has to be high cash flow. And we set significant money inside. I have 12 to 14 months of rents set aside right now. One, we're, you, we don't take, we don't spend the money because we want to use it to buy the next property, right? And there are maintenance costs that come up. We had to refurbish a deck and a dock. It was $20,000. So there are things that happen when you're purchasing properties that your criteria changes dramatically. On a long term hold, absolutely. If I'm looking at an appreciated market like Cedar Hills, Dude, I'll take a zero up to 50%, $50 a month hit every month because I know that the cash flow and the tax appreciation, tax benefits are going to be dramatic. Oh, and I, I have a property, one of my uh, one of my first rentals outside of um, my my personal residence that I rented um, in Salt Lake. And that was, I still negative cash flow on that. And I've, I've had that one uh, for a minute. And that was again another situation where I, I looked for a win win situation. This was a homeowner that was losing his home to foreclosure. It had been in the home for 50 years or in the family for 50 years. And, you know, as I sat down with this individual, he, he was like, you know, we had an investor, you know, say that we could stay in the home if we gave up the equity. And I, I mean, the conversation was like, so you're telling me you'd walk away from your equity if you can stay in the home? And, and he said, yes. So I negative cash flow about a hundred dollars a month, um, but you know, I, I, at the time, so I paid one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for that property. Now, for him, the market, I, I only, it's nine hundred dollars of rent every single month. So you could look at that and be like, well, you're crazy to lose money every single month, right? Um, for them, nine hundred dollars, that's a third of what I could charge in rent. Um, I have a fifteen year lease with them though. So I know, I mean, yes, $100 a month, um, I'm going to lose, what is that property I'm going to lose, um, so I just have the appraisal on it, it it's about $520,000. So you made $400,000. And, and so for me, like, even if you just look at it, like I look at my statement every single month of, okay, I paid $100, but they're still paying, they're even, because, even with their $900 payment, their principal, my principal is being reduced by much more than a hundred dollars. I mean, I'm, a, I'm about, you know, it's right around $450 a month that my principal balance is being reduced. And kind of when I have my aha moment that I would be willing, now I don't, I don't advise all the time going and losing money unless you're walking into equity, right? Or there's a unique situation. But when I first started getting into investing into stocks, you know, I hired a financial planner and we invested in, I think it was just mutual funds. It was something like, like that. And I was paying a hundred dollars a month. At the end of the year, I looked and I was actually paying $52 in fees to him. I it was, was netting $48 a month and looked at the end of the year and I had $600 in my account. And I was like, okay, like, I can go do that in real estate. And as Lonnie showed in her numbers, the num you know, the appreciation and the principal reduction every single month is going to be better. And so I'd rather lose a hundred dollars a month in real estate than put a hundred dollars a month into the stock market. Was kind of my thing. Okay. So um, I do want to because we didn't really how did how do you guys how do you find your properties? So there's lots of ways to do that. One of the ways. Um, if you have access to the MLS, look for weird stuff. I've gotten great properties because people didn't know, they didn't give the square footage on the basement or it's, you know, they miscalculated something or whatever. So properties on the MLS, people think, well, that's not a reasonable place to look, but it's a great place to look. 
talk to your agents. You know, agents know the market. Um, drive around. Honestly, say, this is my niche. This is the area that I'd like to buy a property in. Drive around. If you see a property that looks neglected, for example, then don't go knock on that door and say, hey, you guys, your property is terrible. Sell it to me. But <laughs> what you do want to do is maybe knock on the neighbor's door and say, you know what? I'm looking for a property in this area. Do you know anybody who might be interested in selling? They're going to say, well, those guys over there suck. So go ahead and call them. They also might say, you know what? We're interested in it. So drive the neighborhood, see what's out there. Um, I, there's so, it, I like investment clubs. There's several investment clubs around that you can join. And they send me investment properties 60 days. If they do send you investment properties and you want to consider that property, do your own numbers on it because they're going to inflate those numbers. So do your own numbers. Know, okay, this is the value. This is what I can rent it for. This is how much it's going to cost to rehab if there's work to be done. Um, but they are a, they're a good source of possible properties. Where are we finding the investment firms? So you have my card. Um, shoot me a text. Okay, but it's your program. It is not. Yeah, so <laughs> there's a number of them, and you have our contact information as well. There are social media groups as well. Yeah, Salt Lake Ria. Salt Lake Ria. There's a couple of a different ones. Utah Valley investors. Yeah. So, uh, I don't have any connection with them anymore because honestly, I am not I'm trying not to buy more properties. It's hard. It's hard because I love doing it. I love to buy an ugly property and make it beautiful, and neighbors come over and say, well, this is so much nicer, you know, I mean, I just, it makes my heart sing, but I'm trying not to do that anymore because I don't. So I looked at that as my um, retirement account, and I got to tell you, it's pretty good at this point. So for me, on the short-term rental world, um, there are social media groups. Uh, you cannot purchase a short-term rental on projected income. It has to be documented income. So if you are purchasing in that realm, you want to go buy a six hundred thousand dollar property, and the average normal long term rent is less than that. You will not be able to acquire that. You have to have documented income, or it has to be a documentable property, meaning it has to have at least a year or two years of documentable short term rental income, balance sheets, financial statements. So basically, you are buying a turnkey short term rental. Property. Yep. Yes, and there are more expensive too. Probably. There will be there will be a premium for that, but at the same time, you can walk in and purchase one of those. Um, there are multiple social media groups that market those properties. There are real estate investor, real estate agents that specialize in short-term rentals. Um, I don't remember the name, but there's actually an accreditation they can get that they can work in that realm. But short-term rentals are a little different in that sense. Um, do you have to qualify to purchase the property on the long-term rents? And then for me, as far as finding properties, right? So. Um, I kind of look a couple different places. So when I when I got into the business, when I started, I actually so I worked for a wholesaler. Do you guys know what wholesalers are? Right. So they they go they 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 tie up properties and they they essentially sell them to they they sell their position in their contract for a profit. And so I actually worked for a wholesaler for two years, knocking doors, looking at the notice of default list. We spent thousands and thousands of dollars every single month in mailers. And, and so when I kind of, when I was then looked to this side, when I actually wanted to hold the properties, uh, I looked at, okay, these guys spend the time, effort, and energy in it. And so where do I find my properties? I find them on the MLS. So I actually, even though I'm a real estate agent, I use a real estate agent to find me good rental properties. That's something he spends a lot of time. He actually, he makes two offers a day from wholesalers or because again, we don't use their numbers. I use my numbers, and if I don't buy it, I don't buy it. But he he's making offers every single day uh, for me because I I have another job, right? I'm working in my day to day, and I want my real estate investing to be passive. And so he's on all the wholesalers lists where he's getting them. He's you know going and seeing the properties. He's touring them. I'm more than happy to pay that commission because I'm going to make my offer based off of you know, what my number is anyways. And at the end of the day, I'm able to buy, you know, 
I'm able, I have the opportunity to buy more property than I even want. And I'm not spending a dollar sending out mailers, doing pay-per-click campaigns. I mean, if you search, you know, just do a Google search, cash offer for my home, you're going to see all the people that are, you know, paying for pay-per-click or spending money on SEO to get those leads. You know what? I'm okay if they make some money as long as I find a property that meets my criteria. And, you know, we were able to flip, you know, close to a dozen homes last year. We bought five new rentals. And so you're, and all I did was, Wholesalers in the MLS. Like I use a real estate agent to find the properties, even though I have my real estate license. There are deals to be had that are out there, especially you know if you have some. I think what you're saying too, though, is you find the specialists. Right. There, are, there are a lot of licensed real estate agents, but there are specialists in every category in any industry. Find the specialist. If you're going to hire a real estate agent and you want to flip properties, find someone that specializes as a wholesaler. You can find someone. That specializes in short-term investments and they will earn their fees in gold. Yep. We'll tell you that right now. Okay. Let's look at uh, we're gonna tie kind of together. I mean, as far as an analysis, you touched on a, a product that you use. Is there anything else? I guess any questions you guys have as far as how we analyze, like do you want to know? I mean, I'll tell you my number on uh, as far as analyzing a flip, right? So what do I do? I go in, I, I understand what my holding costs are. So utilities, insurance, things like that. I look at what my, I use hard money. So what is, what is it gonna cost me with my hard money if, you know, every single month if, and I use six months. Um, I've only had one property take me six months. Um, so, and, and we've done some full gut jobs. So six months for me is usually, you know, that built in five months, five or four to five months for repairs and then two months to be able to get it on the market, get it sold and get it closed. So I use a six month period. Um, this last one I have in holiday. I am doing it. I did a 10 month analysis on it though, because it's a, it's a bigger home. It's a bigger project. Then I look at what are my repairs, right? So I go in and when I was trying to figure out what repairs were going to cost me, I spent a lot of time at Home Depot and Lowe's and I, you know, what did this cost? I, had RC Willie come out and bid my home because I wanted to know retail what it was going to cost to redo my floors. Like I spent a lot of time figuring out what it was going to cost up front. I used a contractor, you know, a general contractor when I would go walk the properties. So he could give me a bid pretty much on the spot. And so I spent a lot of time figuring out what it was going to cost for those repairs. So when you're using wholesalers, most of them are like, okay, we've got five days to close on this. How do you go through that process? Is that some like how do your ducks in a row? Yeah. yeah, so so again, kind of I know I know my cost going in. So again, if I didn't know if I wasn't able to price this myself, I'm gonna work with a general contractor. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> let's go through the scenario. The wholesaler blasts it out. Here's a great property. Typically right now, the way they're doing it, because there is so much interest, we're going to have one, a one-time walkthrough, maybe two times at, at those times or none. or none. There are a couple of them. So you're going to take your contractor, you're going to walk through that property. And essentially you've got 24 hours, maybe to tell them what you're willing to pay. So you've got to already have had a conversation with your lender, hard money. You've got to know where your money is going to come from because you're not getting a loan on it, right? And so that's, I factor in those costs with it. I know my repairs, my number on a flip is 20,000. Now I know a lot of investors that won't touch anything if they're not gonna make 50. 20,000 though, that gives me thresh, you know, kind of enough buffer. And anytime that I'm doing repairs, I also build in an oops factor, right? Um, and so depending a paint and carpet job, I'm still gonna build in a $5,000 oops factor. Again, my property I'm doing in holiday, you know, we figured 120,000 in repairs. My oops factor going into that one was $25,000, which we planned on pretty much gutting it. So we knew uh, there wasn't going to be much left over to go oops on. But again, my property in, in Ogden, I mean, that was a full, you know, $10,000 oops that I ran into. So um, when I value a flip, I always look at, um, all of those costs, don't forget all of the weird ones that you don't automatically consider. Sure. But I always look at the six month lead time. Um, I make sure you consider your cost of sale, which include 
you know, are, are you going to hire a, a real estate agent? All of that. I look at always a 10% uh, overage and 5% below market. So if I have 10% over, here's my cost, here's my cost of sale, here's my cost of repair, plus 10%, and then 5% um, less on the market. Guess what? If you make more money than that, thank you very much. Life is good. Yeah, we're very, we're very conservative on our after repair value, right? Right now in this market, um, homes are appreciating. They are. Do not ever go with, and we've lost homes to investors and they've made their money, but they're banking on appreciation. I mean, I met one that's like, no, we want it to take eight months so that we can on the back end, um, you know, make that money. Well, you know, when you bank on that, let's look at a big business that tried to do that in Zillow, right? I mean, they had their Zillow offer, they were banking on appreciation and they shut that wing of their business down. I mean, here you have a billion dollar corporation that, you know, was hedging on the appreciation. Don't do that. Be conservative. Don't say, and, and the other thing on that, when you're looking at what repairs and, you know, things like that, make sure you look at the properties around it. Do not put high-end finishes and magnets. Who taught you that? Right? Me. I'm sure Lonnie saw pretty it's much me. everything on, I told on it. So, like, I mean, well, if you're in, you are starting to see some high end finishes in that. It, 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 you, just, just, yeah. you are. And I mean, again, and you it's look, the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, you don't put granite in, in box stoves if you have a, a little three bedroom home with a one bath. I mean, that's, I see people all the time and fall in love with them. It's like, oh, look at this. It has to have, you know, six panel doors and it has to have granite countertops and it has to have blah, blah, blah. Well, because that I didn't live in a property that didn't have that. Okay, then don't. But if you're building, if you're building out for a rental, consider the neighborhood. Yeah, so so you want to make sure you're not over rehabbing because you can lose money that way quickly, right? There's some things that you can do that are very inexpensive though, to all of a sudden upgrade the house, right? So spend maybe an extra 50 bucks on the dining on the on the chandelier that goes over the kitchen table. Spend an extra, you know. 20 bucks on it. Don't buy the $15 builder grade vanity light. Go ahead and spend a hundred bucks on it, right? So we usually probably overspend on our fixtures by about a thousand bucks, but now all of a sudden those fixtures look amazing. But I'm not gonna go put, you know, I we actually do put granite in everything, but, but you've got a supplier. We've got a supplier, but we also are doing, you know, if it's west side, we're doing level one granite. There's I mean, you can get into granite for fairly inexpensive that still looks amazing. And you can go put level six granite in something that, I mean, is going to break the bank. I mean, you can, so again, it, kitchen cabinets, you know, you can, you can do Lowe's cabinets some places, other places you need custom cabinetry. So you need to make sure you're rehabbing for the area. Rentals, I mean, most of the time you're going to end up replacing it, right? I mean, so it, on a lot of, not on everything, but on carpet. Like, so you're not going to put in. No, like, don't put in spendy carpet. Spendy carpet or things like that. Don't put right? in spendy laminate because that's the stuff that gets. So I guess you're going to replace the flooring yeah. at some point if you're you're holding it long term. Um, but on the same token, if you don't improve your rental, if you walk in and your rental looks like it's been owned by a slumlord, you're not going to get the quality of tenant that you're looking for because. If they go in and it's clean and you know freshly painted and, and it's you know repaired, not ran down, they're going to take care of it a lot better than okay, this is already beat up. You know, and if you're it up. Regular, you have regular inspections. They know that you're expecting to keep the property. Up. True that, um, and the whole clean, clean, clean. It doesn't have to be you know the immaculate well it does have to be immaculate it doesn't have to be the greatest and the most fabulous in the neighborhood but it has to be clean your ovens have to be clean all your yep. little bridges have to be clean so you get clean nice people if you have clean nice property if yep. you have crappy property the likelihood that the clean nice people are going to live there is pretty slim you know pretty slim so the best thing i would say for real properties is good good cleaning person you know get Get, you might pay a little more, but somebody who does like that take a little job, get all those little things done so that it's clean. I'm going to pay for the CD. 
And then as far as buying the property, let's talk, you know, briefly as far as purchasing. Have you guys, I mean, are you the standard 20% down for an investment property? Or have you guys been able to acquire any properties using more of a strategic financing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I think that uh, it comes down to creativity. You know, if you, the longer that you're in the investment game, uh, the different the different ways that you can manage properties, right? So we got really fed up with our long-term rentals when we flipped and purchased the short-term rental. It wasn't intended to be. A... <laughs> no, I had a great management company. I got really tired of fixing stuff that uh, contractors couldn't do properly. I grew up in the trades. And so I would catch them trying to cut corners on my property and frustrate them to a pretty high level and to the fact where I drug plumbing out of the property and threw it on the owner's desk in the office. <laughs> With the construction drawing of what they did wrong. And he offered me a job. And I said, I'm not here to buy a job. I'm here to get my money. So we pay cash for the rental property in, that we have now with the intent of it's a family asset and wanted to keep it in the family. And I wanted to pay the bills, was the essential goal. Uh, we have since refinanced 125% of the investment out of the property. So we have zero dollars in that property at this point. Uh, so we, we did a cash investment to protect the cash flow standpoint because we weren't sure there's a little bit of a gamble there. But now that we know the cash flow is correct, we have zero dollars invested in the property and it makes more money than I thought it would. Uh, which, so, yes, we've done all kinds of investment strategies from zero to three percent down. When I was investing in the mortgage fraud era, I would call it 05, 06, 07, where you could just write the name on paper and if you could breathe, you could get a loan. I'm going to come from an insurance standpoint, though. I watched the crash of 07 happen with every straw bar or betting on the appreciation in Draper. I watched 45 homes go to foreclosure in like two months. And I bought them. It was a hell of a deal. I bought my house for $32,000. <laughs> no, it's, it now rents, and I, I had this little old couple in there for like 10 years, so they did a good rent, but it rents for about 1200 dollars So, you know, better than a kick in the fan. Um, so your question was down financing. Yeah. I did a HELOC on my equity and bought, so my HELOC came in at a lower interest rate, but you can pull that money out immediately. So did that. Um, I have done owner financing quite a bit. Um, you can watch that because most owner financing has a balloon. So they'll say we'll give you owner financing for five years and then you have to refinance or pay it off in some way. So owner financing can be great, but just keep that in mind. There's also issues with the one sell clause, which is the home deal you should talk to your real estate agent about. Um, I have done I, I actually had a couple of properties where they said, just take it, just take it. Assume the mortgage. We just, well, yeah, um, assume the mortgage. No, no, it's, we don't want to deal with this problem anymore. So then you have to have a little bit of upfront cash to pay something on their equity, but to pull in a, a you know, a, a low interest loan on a deal like that, where they're not going through all of your credit and waiting 45 days and doing all so I think you do have to you have to be careful about some um, creative financing because I've seen some stuff that can be in big trouble. I would say anytime you're looking at doing some kind of creative financing, talk to your CPA or somebody who has some good background information about that. Make sure that it puts you in a good position and not something that you would totally regret in three or four years. I, I would recommend if you're going to look at a creative financing, you find a good real estate attorney. 100% find a good real estate attorney because oftentimes those deals happen on the side of the market. Some of them are fraud. Yeah, so you so if by having an attorney stepping in and paying them three or four or five thousand dollars to review and analyze that contract, you will save yourself a nightmare. Yeah. So just if you're looking at creative financing or somebody's offering you that process, hire an attorney. And in, in the strategy that I, that I guess my favorite strategy, I don't know, has, has anyone heard of the FER model? Yeah. So where you buy, rehab, 
rent, refinance, and repeat, right? So what we like to do is we do like to find properties that need repairs. Um, you know, we go in, we do buy them with hard money, we repair them. And our goal is when we refinance that property, we're hoping that we don't have to have that much of a down payment because we've been able to improve the value. And so we've had a number of properties that we've got into for less than $5,000 because we were able to go in and buy them at a discount, put the money in as far as, and we actually, we have access, we've been able to even borrow on the repairs. And so where we haven't, I mean, honestly, during the, the purchase and the repairs, we haven't put very much of, if any of our own money, and then we'll, we'll refinance it in the back end where we, we walk into kind of that 20% equity position. Um, sometimes we're not quite there. And so we've had to bring a little bit of money uh, to the closing table as well. That's my favorite way um, to get into to properties. But if the number is pencil and you you have the funds and you've saved up, um, you know, you're, you can do a little bit more of a, a standard loan as, as well. Um, so there, there's a couple couple of different ways in, in we definitely can can either do another class or we can talk, you know, a little bit offline of some of the different ways to to finance homes. But I would say if I'm looking to build kind of that team, I would look for, you know, someone that has, and again, I can give you these names, but someone that has experience in seller finance. There's a title company that we use that they have an attorney on staff. That's kind of how they built their business was on seller financing have a hard money lender so that if you find that scream of a deal that you need to be able to close in a week that you can pull it off and then have a, a good mortgage lender that is going to help you with the refinance or can help you with the, the purchase up front. How much are you paying for hard money? Y'all know what hard money is. Pretty much always I have like a basic idea of right about it or this podcast, but I don't have so our money is, I have a, a big chunk of money that I'm going to just lend to him because I know he's a good, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's a good risk. So I'm going to just lend it to him, but I am not going to do it three and a half percent. I'm going to be making some big money. Plus, I'm going to have it underwritten so that if he doesn't complete his deal within six months, then he either has to give me the property or pay me a bunch more money to extend my loan. Yeah, extensions are expensive. So, so what do you usually get hard money at? Yeah, so we're anywhere two to four points up front. So two to four percent up front is, and they just tack it on the loan. So a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So we're two two to four thousand dollars, you know, on a hundred thousand that is built onto the loan, and then it, it's a twelve percent interest rate. See, twelve percent. <gasps> But it's worth it because you can get in, get it, make your money back. You counted that in your cost of sale and whatever. But that's the difference like between six month and a ten month analysis. Is that twelve percent interest on the monthly holding costs? So if if you're not, and I will say this, if you if you don't have any experience in the construction industry or have someone who you can really really rely on and count on, the Burr method is very very scary to start. So going in and rehabbing a property with no construction experience, you're relying on a contractor. And if you don't know that contractor, just find a realtor or someone that has worked in that world and work with them on that process, but don't do that alone. Right. Um, the other thing that I would say from an insurance person standpoint is if your real estate person has not purchased and managed their own investments, they don't know the process. So if, if you're looking to hire a realtor, you want to work with them, ask them the question, have you flipped the property? Do you hold your own long-term rentals? If the answers are no, step up and walk away because they don't know the process. Mike and I were just talking about this a little bit ago. He's not a real estate agent. If they've never built a home, they have no idea what it goes to take for, for a buyer to go through that building process. No idea. You may stand on the side of that process and understand from a, from a real estate agent's perspective, but until you're sitting in those shoes and you've experienced that experience, they don't know what, what that process looks like. I can tell you from a perspective, my dad's a plumbing heat contractor, I grew up in the trades. So I have a lot of construction experience. I was very familiar with that. I went through the um, plumbing program. I was a year away from having a plumbing business and I walked away because I don't want to work in that industry. But if you don't know that industry, find an experienced person that has walked in those shoes with you and they were willing to do that for the first couple of times. 
don't do it alone. Okay, so we we are running, just to kind of wrap it up, and we're not gonna get through all of this piece, but I mean, hopefully you've been able to get some good content, but kind of I to wrap it up, and then I'm, I'm definitely willing to stay after for questions and things like that for anyone. Um, Let's talk about, so who are your professionals that you want to have in your world, right? So we, we talked a little bit, find a general contractor, you know, that, that can help you with those repairs. Um, a property management company, the thing that I love about property management companies as well, is they have access to, you know, a lot of the times they can give you a referral for a good plumber, electrician, because they're using people every single day, right? So they can provide kind of that bigger network of professionals um you know it if you build out you know over time you're going to build out to have a plumber an electrician a good handyman you know someone that's just good at going in and patching drywall and things like that um and then an insurance agent insurance is different you know than your personal residence and so especially as you build out portfolios you know i i use kirk and he's able to say okay you're now at a threshold that instead of insuring every single one, we're going to do more of an umbrella or blanket policy and you're going to move properties in and out. I mean, so there's different ways. And if you have a good insurance agent, they're going to watch and make sure you have the correct insurance. With insurance, cheapest is not always best. I mean, you want to make sure that you're covered or if something happens. Um, who am I missing? So a real estate agent, um, you know, again, finding these properties that have experience in it, that if you want to get into flipping, that honestly could hold your hand through the first couple of flips. And I would say a mortgage lender. A, and, and a mortgage lender. Inspector. And, and an inspector. So a mortgage lender uh, that has done or does a significant amount of investment work it is not afraid to refer if they're not fit. I would say a home inspector who has done more than a thousand inspections. Don't well, hire. <laughs> right. I'm saying more than that. Yeah. So I know Fred has done tens of thousands, but what I'm saying is in that sense where there are lots of people that can go out and throw a shingle on and say, I'm a home inspector. There's no licensing requirements in the state of Utah for, for a home inspector. Now, so anybody can call themselves an inspector. So they yeah. can go get an ASHI certification. I don't remember what the other one is. So there are different certifications that they can get. But I would just ask the question, how many inspections have you done? If it's under a thousand, or their group has done under a thousand, I would look for somewhere else, personally. Um, Let me throw in a little bit about management too, just so that y'all know. Most people think, well, I don't have to pay somebody to do that, which you don't, that's a true fact. But just for example, if you have a rental property and it's vacant for one month, because you don't have time to show it, you need some small repairs, whatever the reason is, if it's vacant for one month, you pay my fee for almost a year. So what, what's that value? No calls at two o'clock in the morning. No, I cannot find a handyman to save my life, which is what happens so often in this market. But you know, like you say, the cheapest isn't always best. You need to find somebody that you trust and can rely on to take care of all of these issues. And there's a lot of people out there and you have to do a little bit of due diligence to find out who's going to be good to work with and who's going to answer their phone, which that in itself is a surprising, you know, level, but people who answer their phone are not that common. So talk to people that you trust, get to know who we use, why we use them, you know, shop a little bit, do your due diligence because a good team makes your likelihood of success the I guess the criteria for me when I'm interviewing with anyone I want to work with is what's their data down? Do they care enough about me, my investment, to answer the phone, to give me that insight when I may have missed something? Do they care enough? That's why I said to give it to them. Do they care enough to help me protect my investment? Um, one quick thing I want to talk about insurance between short term rental and long term rental. Short term rentals don't have tenants. They are not tenants, they are guests. So the insurance prospect is dramatically different when we talk about short term rental insurance versus long term rental. So at the 30 day mark, they become a tenant, which then all of the landlord laws come into place. If they're under 30 days, they're a guest like a hotel, they pay fees and taxes like a hotel. 
So if someone is overstaying their welcome, they're no longer a tenant, they're trespassing. So just understand that process on the insurance side of things. Most insurance carriers do not allow for under 30 day rental contracts. So you have to have specialty insurance for short term rental insurance, and it is expensive. Where long term rentals, the tenant has to have their own coverage. So you have to have their own, well, both have to have coverage, but right. from the landlord and the owner's perspective, you are buying a different insurance policy. And you can buy a commercial policy or you could buy a personal policy that doesn't matter as much as far as how you hold the property. But you need to make sure that that, prop, that carrier allows for the exposure or the risk of short term rentals. Because if they don't and you have a claim, you will be denied and you will be left holding the bag. And I can tell you those claims can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, there are carriers that you need to double check to make sure they don't have a dog exclusion. Because if they're allowing pets in your property and the dog bites somebody, anybody have any experience about that on the news in the last year about maybe an arm being ripped off a child? <laughs> Did you guys see that at Sugar House? That's a real estate agent in one of the brokerages locally at the brokerage's name for $2 million. Because the landlord did not allow dogs to do they were there and document them three times. So he he went back upon his contract and because he was a realtor, he has a, a higher fiduciary liability and a duty. And so it fell back on the brokerage responsibility as well. That is still being litigated. And I set up both policies. So I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, you do not want to be in a situation where your insurance does not want you to write a check because it will cost you everything. So that's from 25 years or 20 plus years in the insurance industry and owning investment properties I've seen most claims go whichever direction they go buy policies and ask them to review contracts a couple of things you need to look at is sewer coverage because if there's poop in a house you want it to get paid for sewer drink you want it to go down <laughs> but sometimes it comes back up in the drain that's a specific coverage you want to have animal liability coverage um, there are actually utility services coverage now where on older homes maybe the water line or the sewer line goes bad you can file a claim on insurance now for some of those carriers you are going to pay for it. But when it costs $15,000 to put the new water light in, it's a pretty good pay, you know, 40 bucks a year. It's a pretty easy trade off. Yeah. So from that process, don't buy the cheapest insurance policy out there. Find the coverages that fit for what you need. Older properties need more coverage. These things go wrong in older properties more often. In brand new properties, things go wrong more often. Because let's just say builders aren't always willing to Go the full length to make sure it's not going to shock How is that? How did it pass inspection? Yeah. Right. I asked that question. <laughs> it's about, it's about, yeah. right. How is that possible in a brand new So just understand that from a short term, long term perspective. You don't have tenants, you have clients, and they are guests. Long term rentals, they are tenants. And if you ever face a legal issue where you're trying to have someone removed from the property, do not ever use the word tenant because it's a civil matter. If they're trespassing, it's a criminal matter. I'm just going to bring it up. So there's my tip of the day. If you ever have short term rentals and they are under a 30 day contract, they're trespassing. You can be removed by the police. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're at noon. So again, I'm more than happy to stay for questions. Uh, what didn't we cover that you're hoping? I mean, if you have any questions, did we give you enough to chew on for a little bit? Right now, will we? Anything? So to move for short term, you want to go to the city and find out what the regulations are for short term, right? Whatever municipality that the property is in. Two different spots CCNRs, if it's an HOA, and municipality. Probably more um, open when you go out. I'll kind of touch on all everything, and it's, it's uh, got a lot of questions. Just kind of limit everything. You talk about a 10% down. Uh, they down don't America. Want to know about, about that. My interest in short term real estate is mainly because I have a fourplex that I know that I want the units. So, an idea is that it needs to be rehabbed. And so, just doing that for a period of time just to kind of get higher cash flow before going back to more traditional rentals. And since it's on a VA loan, I have the option to also do like a. 100% refi out and just kind of 
in a, in a place where I already got the floor plan, so I have a bunch of things now, and it's trying to see. Where what, is it? That, that's a huge part. issue. Yeah, where is your it's, it's a gross part. So it's not the nicest area. So that's the thing that I kind of thought because I because I've been on here and they have their own projections of that area because there are uh, short terms in that right in that area. So I guess what's the question behind it? And I know you'll probably want to right. ask her. So that's just a small thing, but it's just more of where to go next, where to as far as just looking at buying rentals in here because you because you talked about you know being that like with the bird method the bigger properties it's just all multifamily. So that's just pretty much all I've seen. Been looking for and also uh, interested in in order finance because yeah. it's just that force multiplier instead of sinking all the money in and also just the kind of terms that I've alleged that I've heard people being able to get yeah that are really good on the cash flow perspective. Owner financing is a little bit difficult because it's hard. There's a lot of math there, but it's kind of hard to find it. So it's more kind of word of mouth and and. That's why I think these um, investor clubs and that kind of thing can be beneficial. Don't believe everything you hear. There's a lot of like blah, blah, but, but if you kind of shift it all down, there's some real benefits to that. And one of those is you can kind of tap in with some of those because they don't normally advertise and they don't normally, um, you know, they're not on the MLS a lot. There's, it's usually kind of word of mouth. Mm -hmm. and, and with owner finance, so I guess on that, if I was going to target, you still have to have some money, yep, um, right? And so where almost every single one of my owner finance deals has come is someone that is no longer making their payments. So mm -hmm. if I was going to target owner finance, I'd probably target the notice of default list. One, it's public, right? So you can... You can mail to it. You can go knock doors if you you know get some thick skin. They're behind on their payments. They don't want to see you. There's going to be a lot of other people knocking on their door. But the thing about that, I, again, I, in those situations, and with owner finance, typically you're looking for that win-win situation. And so, kind of my my pitch when I did those was, okay, like I'm actually going to bring your mortgage current, and I'm going to give you some money that you can relocate, right? Because and, and depending on if they have equity, then you've got to cash them out of their equity too. So what, what I was actually looking for is people that didn't have equity or at least didn't have much, but I was able to get into the property without, you know, you know, around $10,000 because I got to bring them up. I got to pay their attorney fees for filing that notice of default. So you're usually 10 to $12,000 to get them to that point. But again, it was still better than going through the whole loan right. process, but that's, Outside of that, it, it really is kind of a, a lucky situation unless you're working some of the wholesale bills come across that they're willing to do seller finance, but they still want paid, right? They want their $20,000 wholesale fee and they've still got to cash out the homeowner. So typically when you see an advertised seller finance deal, you're still looking at $50,000 that you're going to have to come, come in. So again, those are a little bit harder to find. They're almost like you fall into them a lot of the times. And again, if I was targeting that though, I would be looking at the notice of default list because again, I can come in to offer, I can actually help them because now I'm going to be making timely payments. I'm going to um, get them current again, um, but you got to make sure their loan is. And a lot of them are in, in more desperate situations because if you didn't have to, why would you do that? Right. So like the last one that I bought on, well, well, that's when he bought on a seller finance. The guy was in, you know, all of, all of his life had fallen apart. Mm -hmm. So the last thing he wants to do is have somebody come in and say, well, I'm going to nickel and dot you. Right. It's like, I'm going to take this over. I'm going to resolve this problem that you have so you can take it off your problem list. We're going to be fair with you. I got a good deal on it because I didn't have to pay, you know, his full equity. He got a good deal on it because it was a fast deal and we got him out right away. So that was a bonus. The last one I sold on owner financing, they came in over sales price with 30,000 down each. Bam, done in like three days. So you have to be quick. You have to have money in, in hand and you have to really be considerate of what their process is and not try to just I want, I want, I want. 
right? Because I think I was listening to some uh, uh, your point right there. If you know, you're going to finance with zero percent, and maybe you can offer them more than the market value because of the interest being or the only way that. I can see that work is if they own it free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they got a payment they got to make, right. and if they're not making their payment, mm -hmm. and you buy it on a situation like that, you bought nothing. You bought more book, right? <laughs> and so just kind of looking at strategy. You know, you've got that whole you know, like that. So you just want competition for those guys like that. Right. And so well, and that's honestly that's why right now I stay away from I, I'm not looking at duplexes mm -hmm. because I mean what people are paying for duplexes today like doesn't make sense. Like to me, I can't back into why they're even doing it. Like I was just browsing the Utah real estate website and yeah. there was an open there was an open house for this fourplex on the east side. Like, Let's do it. You know, it's, it's like, like, like I was saying, I'm trying to just kind of immerse myself in the real estate business. Um, that works for that. Yeah. And they wanted uh, 1.2 million for this fourplex. So we're all like one bedroom. And I think the rent yeah. they were charging was just like maybe a thousand. Yeah, go buy for it. Go, and, go buy four single. And, and all the cabinets were old metal cabinets from like the 40s or 50s. They all they played this. It's like I can tell you right now, most of the multifamily investors that I insure are not investing in Utah. Yeah, and that, that's the thing I was looking at. They're taking their cash, their equity position because people yeah. are buying well, what they call buying down. And, yeah. and they're and taking that money. money. Uh, some are going to Idaho, some are going back to California. And you're seeing what a lot of the ones that are buying those are actual financial institutions mm -hmm. that are actually essentially paying cash for the property. So there is cash flow. They don't have to worry about right. financing. Mm -hmm. And now they're in, in if they're That's doing right. it, some of them might do it as a syndicate or some pool money. Right. And so now all of a sudden, you know, that cash flow is actually giving them a return that's beating the stock market. Right. So they're doing it. But for me to go in and put debt financing in place of that, like, the, the appreciation just, I mean, because it's already at a premium, it's going to appreciate like single family and my cash flow isn't going to be what I could do in a single family. And you'd have to give me a fourplex with one bedroom. Two. You would have to give it to me <laughs> and I would say, eh, I don't know. Maybe right. then, okay. I'll flip it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's why you know, I have probably have like Tennessee and Arkansas and just kind of trying to browse around some other areas. Tennessee right now, there are, there are people Doing very, very well in Tennessee. But it's just, I guess, also since I'm here, we talk about meeting in their yard, it's a little right. bit scary to try and say, how, how do I break into something like that? Right. And then I can see with building a single family is where, you know, multi family promises scalability, but there's all that competition, but then there's all these single family houses. It's much easier to catch those. I think you have to pick what kind of market you want to work in. The single family tenant is a drastically different tenant than a multi family. Well, like my, my philosophy always is they're building like a gazillion of these high rise apartments, mm -hmm. which are great for, you know, singles, for couples, for maybe one child. But once I believe, once you get children, a high rise apartment is not what everybody wants to live in. So I love single family homes. I have never have any problem keeping my homes ready. And I was, I was reading about because we see all these high rises going up, and I was reading this thing that that because of that concentration in that one lot, the force appreciates only in single family houses that are in the vicinity. What so, else? Uh, I can talk about one investment strategy that no one's talked about. Okay. It's called arbitrage. You may heard of arbitrage. What is it? Uh, it's where you make make it the profit. Ah, you well, I know based on the stock market. Okay, so it would be like you have a certain type of bond. You have your bond and converts into a regular stock, but they're both at a different price, and when it's converted straight over, they make some money. So in the real estate world, they they talk about arbitrage in the short term home market, and it's where you rent a property on a long term contract, and you convert it to a short term rental, which is really a pain in my butt. <laughs> Sorry, but there are there are a lot of people that are breaking into the investment world because your barrier to entry is rent. You're not putting it down payment on the rent. I'm not going to tell you it's a great idea. But I'm, I'm going to tell you a lot of people are trying to do it. And they are failing. Yes, they are. But if you own a rental property, make sure that the tenant that you 
rent to is not then going to sub rent it out as a short as a, a short term rental. rental because remember how we talked about more damage or liabilities, all of that stuff. I get people calling me constantly on the properties that I manage saying, well, you know, we'll pay you hundred dollars more. We'll pay you four hundred dollars more if you bet us lease it. I'm like, <clears throat> good luck. I hope you find someone and leave. Because you really have to keep in mind all of these issues. So it is it is an investment strategy. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna take both perspectives because I manage risk for a living. Mm -hmm. um, there is an opportunity there, but you have to be very, very clear with your landlord what's happening. Uh, and you have to be willing to take on all of the maintenance, including the repairs of the tenant. So if someone damages a property, you are liable. So uh, become more of a master lease then mm -hmm. where you're because that's what they call it, I think you're you're kind of because it's a slightly different type of the lease then, but it's just one thing. Okay, so you have to have a lease. The lease has to be modified accordingly, and you need to be notifying your landlord and paying your insurance to be modified. So do the right thing if you're going to look at that as an investment strategy. But certainly, there's one that does work in certain markets. Utah is one of those markets that can't work. <coughs> so the same thing as what you were talking about before, which is doing your analysis and making sure you're in the right place. Like you don't want to do it in my neighborhood in Atlanta because no, I buy lots of investments in Magra. All day long every day. So just a question from here as well. So this says how are long-term rentals affected per se if the market does crash? And that I mean, as far as if I were to answer it, that's a risk, right? The the, the value would go down, but at the same time, again, if you're looking back at a long, long play, like even when the market crashed, I mean, people still had to go rent somewhere. People have to live somewhere. 34% of the Utah population has. So, so if you're doing you have the capacity, I thought the rental market stayed pretty stable. It did stay. Yeah. Um, it I, doesn't change that much. Yeah. As, as an old lady, I had properties that I was renting throughout the whole thing. I saw it as a huge opportunity to purchase, honestly, and it worked out well. But incoming rents, there was a small decrease because you always have to rent according to what the market is. But people have to live somewhere. So there was really a small decline, and it never made a major impact on my business. So well, the homes what? that were being lost too were due to foreclosure, and then they can't just go out and buy another house. So they have to have some like you said, right. have some other yeah. And then I know you touched on this a little bit, but as far as what what happens to rent, does it go up or down, or what causes it to go up and down? So yeah, it's supply and demand, 100%. You rate your property according to location, condition, and um, comparables in the area. So like this year, um, I always consider if, if the person has been in there long-term, I don't raise the rent as much long-term because it always costs you to have vacant property and then to remarket and go through all of that. But um, you just have to really look at the comparables in that neighborhood and um it generally always goes up generally i mean i'm not saying it never goes down but i always look at a five percent increase across the board um and this year i'm sneaking that up a little bit even on people who live there but if they move out and then i re-rent a property we're going to look at a significant increase in rents okay any other questions okay make sure i've got out there make sure i get your name and email and phone number i will email you guys all of my kind of preferred professionals so you can at least start having these dialogue right a hard money lender insurance property management i want to be able to send that to you so you guys have you know essentially kind of if you don't have someone already at least you have someone to call um and, and then that way you'll have my information as well and so if you want to dialogue um, additional about any of the, the strategies that we talked about. If you want to dive into a little bit more of, you know, financing, creative financing. Um, you know, I, I when I started, I I literally didn't have anything in the bank. Um, if you're not a, adverse to risk, I mean, I can talk to you kind of about my story because I mean, I got to the point where I I literally said I'm either going to make it or I'm going to go bankrupt, um, and so. You know, my first flip, I 
it was 100% hard money. It was all on credit cards. And I was a nervous, nervous wreck. And I would never recommend, like, I'm never going to advise that because, again, I don't want it to fall back on me. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I wasn't saving money. I wasn't, I, it was like, I don't know how I'm ever going to get into this. And so I dumped both feet in. And today I still haven't spent any money that I've made on flips. I roll them right back into the flips. And so now I don't, well, I still use credit cards. That's another, I, I pay them off every month, but I travel for free because flips are expensive and you can put a lot of money on a credit card pass if you're willing to pay it off every month. And you can rack up some crazy points. Um, I mean, some of the other side stuff that I do, right? But um, again, if if you want to talk about you know a little bit more creative stuff, I'm more than happy to sidebar with you. Um, again, you can get into it, or you can also be take the conservative way and still build a lot of wealth investing. So, so I wanted to say um, one thing because one of the questions um, is. How do you make a determination of whether you want to do rent or sell? So I have a formula. If I'm a formula guy, <laughs> not a formula, but I have a formula for that. And that always was if you, if your total rents over six month period of time is less than what your profit would be to sell it, I'm going to sell that puppy. But if my rents over even over six months, so $2,000 a month, six months, $12,000, not a lot. In this market, you know, I probably, if I can make more than $15,000 on sale after all costs are involved, I'd probably sell. Use that money to go buy a new rental property. So whatever that monthly is, is kind of whatever you want to go with. But that was always my sell or rent kind of long-term rent. I can afford to hold it. I love rentals, obviously. But that way you kind of have a this is my hard and fast rule so my rule on that I, I don't sell property anymore i've watched a market we purchased a property in rose park for 170 thousand it's worth five and i kick myself every day for not continuing to hold that property because in equity i could refinance into more property so if i get to the point where a property has enough equity i think 50 percent is probably where i want to be long term so if I get under that mark, I'm going to take that cash out of my loan because then I get an appreciation. I get all of the expenses associated with that, and I'm going to roll it into an additional property. Uh, for me, I, I don't want to sell property. I want to create legacy. And I don't want my kids to get a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Work for their own. I'm gonna reverse mortgage everything. Yeah, I don't just... <laughs> you can have all the assets, but there won't be a dime of equity left over. Correct. No, but actually, it's pretty true. I've already told them that. It's like, here's the deal you're on your own now. I gave you my heart and soul for 18 years, and then I helped you along. And once you're 30, you've got to <laughs> take care of me. Um, so far, that's not working. But, um, <laughs> I don't even know what the point was. Screw it. Well, my brain went to the whole kids don't get nothing. Um, we'll come back to that. The other thing that I look at is do I want to use a rental property? Because in short term, I'm using the deal. So I vote, I stumble a bit. I can use my property. Does it cost me money? Yeah. But not that much. Or I'll take a weekend that isn't booked to go use it. So if, if you're looking at short-term rentals, that's a consideration you need to think about because I can create family memories in an investment. So there are some, it's not a financial thing that I can tell you is what it's worth, but to spend a week on a waterfront property that I don't have to pay for, it's pretty cool. Well, then you can, you can look at the trip, right? Is I'm going to go out and do maintenance and I'm going to repair it. And now all of a sudden my whole trip becomes right up. Yeah. I mean, so really, I mean, if you are looking. Yeah, the really cool part is when we go so many hours, take my friends so I can charge my friends to go stay somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they pay for my trip. No, so they go, oh, hey, I got this place. I want to pitch in. No, they all know that I own it. They all want to go. Yeah. And they all pitch in. I mean, it, it, they throw a couple hundred bucks at most. It's not like I'm charging the yeah. actual rate, but I don't end up paying to use the cabin at that point. And so there are, there are lots of benefits in the short term. The hassle factor is high. Just understand. The reason why I self manage my property is no one else will. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. It's in a very remote location. There are not a lot 
on short term rentals, it's been market maker in that demographic, if you will. So there are no more short term rentals that make the market there. There's six properties in within a 15 month geographical mile radius. One of them is a two bedroom, and one of them is a 12 bed. They just don't match as far as geographics go. So that's why it was a gamble to say how much it's going to make. We can't tell you. Um, but in that sense, though, there are there's a lot of benefits, but there's a lot of hassle, and there's a lot of automation you need to set up in place. The one thing I can tell you in the short term rental that you will value over anything else is a cleaner. Someone who will spot damage and help you charge the tenant or the client. And someone who will take care of the property and buy the maintenance equipment so that you don't have to. So again, we come back to that data. Dam. So that is probably one of the number one things that I would so if you're going to look at short term rentals, I'm happy to talk to you all day long about it. But maybe if you want to do an analysis, we can do one of those things. Cool. So. And on that note, honestly, I don't care if you use my company or not. I mean, of course, I care. But please ask questions. If you have any questions that I can help you with, gosh, just call. I don't mind a bit. So. Yeah, I would sure. say the one thing that Lonnie knows probably better than anyone else is if she does answer the phone and cares. But the list of services that a, a property manager does, hold them accountable to it. Because so many will list that they will do all these things and then you find out they haven't been in the property in two years. Um, I have seen nightmare stories where they're not releasing escrow in four or five weeks. I've had insurance claims where property managers have multiple managers and locations and they're accepting cash rents and pot papers. So there are lots of issues on the insurance side and I know that doesn't happen over here. So if you are interviewing a property manager, this is a recommendation I would have, make sure they have the correct insurance in place. And one of them is liabilities. It's not a liability policy. It's a uh, bond yeah. for theft of funds because they have a huge fiduciary liability. Think about how much rent is coming. Let's say they have hundred properties. That they That's a decent sized property for at $1,500 a month. All of that goes into one trust account that has to be dispersed. Most of the time it's done automatically in software and a lackey in their office for better terms can go in and change the routing account number and have that money wired to a different account. So they have to have that crime coverage in place to cover your rear ends. So and I would like to say in the industry that just doesn't happen, but I've been in the industry since <laughs> the dinosaurs and um, I've had my own companies and I've tried not to have my own companies. And the reality is it's something that it's a huge investment. You want to absolutely know what's happening. Yep. So. Cool. Are you off there? No. So just wrapping up here, but I'm going to go ahead. And so just this last question, as far as paying off the credit cards and so when I started, yes, I used my HELOC to pay off those credit cards every single month. You know what a HELOC is? Um, you know? Yeah. So a home equity line of credit, that's how I paid off the credit cards. Now, again, I again I haven't spent the money that I've made, so I'm I'm not using you have a HELOC too. You know, I, I have the money for the repairs and the account to, to do it now. But yes, before I didn't want to pay that um, that interest on the credit card. So I was. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. I mean, I was moving money back and forth and being strategic with it. But um, I would say as a timeline, though, you probably don't want to plan on taking cash out of your investments for at least three or five years. Yeah. Just understand that it's a time sink that yeah. you have to put, it, put money back into your investments. We didn't take money out of our long term rentals for the entire time we were in this bank the equity and continue that process. We now can take some money out of our short term rentals because we're putting equity. I still don't, and I own them free and clear. I mean, this is my this is my retirement. So I'll have I'll, it, it. So one other thing that I just want to say that people sometimes don't think about is it's an inflation guard. Yeah. So as inflation goes up, your rents go up. So in twenty years, if it, you know your rents right now are a thousand dollars a month. If inflation goes up, you're, they're going to be five thousand. You know, whatever it is. But as honestly as as a retirement vehicle, it, I think there's none better. It is the same. 
on that. So Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams, right? He, he said that in a conference that I was in a month ago, he said, owning rentals is the single best way to keep up with inflation because the property values go up and the rents go up. I mean, you could have, and I've seen this, you know, even with my father-in-law, you know, he has his portfolio of, okay, here's what my stocks are today and I'm ready to retire. And now all of a sudden that money he had in the bank is not going to go as far as he once thought it was going to go. But with, if you have properties that are paid off, that rent is going to go up with inflation. Yeah. Your debt servicing stays level. Well. Inflation increases your revenue, so your spread gets better the longer you live. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lonnie and Kurt, for coming out. Thank you guys for spending your Saturdays with us. Again, I'll get that email out. Again, if you have questions, um, we didn't get to it, so I apologize. Go home and write down what you're going to do next, if or do it right now. What is your next step to start investing? And if that's, you know, have a consultation with me or Lonnie or Kirk. I mean, definitely take that next step so we can get you moving forward so you don't waste your Saturday. But thank you, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you. So what are future meetups you have? Well, I built my house, so it's going to be slow. What's that? I built my house, so I will.